Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Nanam Paramam Dheyam Knowledge is Supreme Welcome back students. Before the break, we have been looking at traditional advanced controllers and we had looked at cascade control, split range control and within selective control, we looked at override control. Now, there is another type of a control which also forms, uh, which is also a part of selective control. So, that is known as an overriding control, auctioneering control. This is also part of a selective control in such a way that there are many measurements which are used but eventually there is only a single manipulated variable. If I want to contrast this with uh, select uh, override control. In override control also we had, so this is auctioneering, so in override we also had many measurements but along with that we also had their own control loops as well and one of those control loops was active at any time which was used to move the manipulated variable. So, if you want to see the difference between the two, you will see that in auctioneering control, we have many measurements, we, but we do not have that many control loops. So, let us see how does an auctioneering control look like or what is the case where auctioneering control will really be useful. <coughs> so, the very commonly used place where auctioneering control finds its use is a distributed system for example, a PFR <coughs> or a plug flow reactor or a fixed paid reactor. So, let us say we have a fixed bed reactor where a gas phase reaction is taking place. So, you have all the catalyst packing here. and the raw material enters here. The reaction takes place over the length of the reactor and finally, you get the product stream out. Now, typically from your reaction engineering course, you would realize that when you have a distributed system like a fixed bed reactor, then you will see that the concentration will show variation. So, the concentration and temperature, so these are all the variables of this system. So, they will show variation as a function of time as well as location. So, throughout the location, these concentration and temperatures would be different. If I look at the cross section of this, so if I zoom out, uh, zoom in terms of the cross section, let us say a circular cross section. Then even within uh, this cross section as a function of radial distance, you may see uh, that uh, the concentrations and temperatures are different. Even though when we design, we assume that radially the entire uh, section is uniform and uh, we assume the plug flow uh, type of, uh, as, uh, we make a plug flow type assumption, but in reality you can uh, see that or you can expect uh, that these concentrations and temperatures would also vary as a function of radial distance as well and all that is dependent on how well the flow is distributed. So, it all depends on flow distribution or I would say actual flow distribution 
not a theoretical or ideal flow distribution which we use to design this kind of a system. So what happens is in a real fixed bed reactor, you would expect variation of concentration and temperature along the length as well as in a radial direction. And because of that, uh, the if the reaction is exothermic, you may have, uh, you may develop what is known as a hot spot. So at certain location inside the uh, bed, uh, the temperature may shoot up to a very high value. This may be because of some uh, sort of a dead zone uh, where a certain uh, runaway reaction can take place, or there are a lot of maldistribution related issues which give rise to such kind of hot spots uh, in a reactor. So such hot spots are typically uh, <clears throat> can be detrimental for this process because uh, at a certain uh, location uh, the temperature may shoot up to a very high value which may result into catalyst melting or uh, giving rise to some uh, runaway reactions. So it is very uh, essential that uh, you monitor these uh, hot spots and uh, try to control these hot spot temperatures uh, below a certain safe value. The problem comes because you do not know where exactly such a hot spot would develop uh, because you, this is not a theoretical aspect, this is more, uh, it has more to do with the practical flow behavior which are typically not uh, those flow measurements and distribution measurements are not available. So in that case, uh, this becomes a really practical problem in terms of uh, locating such a hot spot and trying to control it uh, below a certain uh, safe value. So what is typically done in such a case is that along the length of the reactor, you would have uh, multiple uh, temperature sensors. So let us say uh, you will have a temperature band of temperature sensors in this location, you will have a band of temperature sensors in this location and depending on uh, how much is the length of the reactor, uh, a certain number of such rings will be placed and even on those rings there will be multiple temperature sensors placed at different radio angular di direction and within that as well uh, you can have, so if I want to show, even at different radial distances you may have a band of temperature sensors. So the idea is that you want to put in uh, as many uh, eyes into the process in terms of temperature measurement so that you want to capture uh, that uh, if there is such hot spot which is getting developed. So having all these uh, 15 or 20 temperature sensors, you have so many measurements. So from that, uh, what uh, the idea is that you want to identify where is the hot spot and hot spot would be the maximum temperature inside this reactor. So given that these are all the measurements, we would be interested in getting the maximum temperature which is measured out of all the sensors which we have and that temperature would be used to control the hot spot. So if I want to show how this uh, strategy would look like, so let us say this is our packed bed reactor. This is your feed, this is your product and from this reactor we will have multiple temperature measurements which will be taken at different location, different radial distance, different angles and all these would go to an auctioneering control which in this case would be the find the maximum out of all these measurements. So let us say this is T1, T2 all the way up to Tn. So you have n measurements. Out of that it will find out whatever is the maximum measurement that uh, gives you an idea about the hot spot and that will be used as a controlled variable or measurement of that controlled variable and eventually you will have a control strategy around that. So this will be the set point and that uh, would be used. control the feed wall. <coughs> so you can distinguish, uh, so this is the, uh, an example of an auctioneering control. So you can see that we are using multiple measurements but for each of those measurements we do not have a control loop. 
we select whichever is the critical measurement rather than a control loop and then take the control action according to that. So, that is the main difference between uh, override control and auctioneering control, but both of these control strategies fall under the case of selective control because we are selecting out of multiple possible control variables or measurements. So, this kind of uh, strategy is very commonly used uh, to control hotspot temperature in a fixed bed catalytic reactor. Let us now move to another uh, traditional advanced control strategy known as a ratio control strategy. <coughs> so, as the name suggests, here we would be controlling a ratio. of certain process variables. Now, in your other chemical engineering courses, uh, you might have seen uh, that uh, there are different ratios which are of importance. For example, uh, if I am talking about uh, distillation or separation, what ratio comes into your mind? You would say that you would want to control or maintain reflux ratio. If you are taking uh, an example of uh, let us say reaction engineering, you might be interested in uh, maintaining feed ratio that uh, certain times uh, you want to maintain uh, that the feeds which are going into your system are at a particular ratio. So, if I want to take an example of ammonia synthesis, you would want that N2 to H2 ratio is 1 is to 3. So, that uh, you get uh, the desired maximum uh, productivity out of that reactor or it can be an excess feed ratio. So, a lot of times in combustion you want to make sure that complete combustion of the fuel occurs. So, you would be supplying air in excess and that how much uh, excess air should be used that ratio can also be uh, one of the key operating parameters in your system. So, this will be for an example in combustion. Another place where you might want to have uh, <coughs> A ratio control is uh, for example, methane steam reforming. Where uh, you want to maintain a steam to carbon ratio. So, lot of places uh, uh, you can revisit your other chemical engineering courses and you will realize that lot of times uh, we are interested in maintain certain ratios because uh, that uh, essentially governs the productivity or economics of that particular system. So, let us see how do we go about controlling or maintaining such kind of ratios in a system. So, to that uh, let me take a very simple example of uh, blending. <coughs> So, blending is a is an operation where you are uh, going to mix two streams <coughs> and you want to mix them in a particular ratio. So, let us say you have a stream A uh, which is coming in from one particular source and uh, you are going to mix it uh, with another stream FB which uh, you can uh, control its flow rate. So, these two are mixed and what you get is the mixture and you want to blend these in such a way that I have a certain F A over F B ratio has to be maintained. So, this can be done in two ways uh, that is uh, so the one way or the straightforward way is you can measure the instantaneous value of F A. So, that is a flow measurement. So, you can measure how much is the flow coming in. You can also measure whatever is the flow of F B coming in and you have a what is known as a division operator. 
So, if you divide F A over F B, it will give you the instantaneous ratio and you can have a controller around that which will have a set ratio. So, let us say the set point here is F A over F B set. So, you, this will be F A over F B set. So, you compare your current value with the set point and accordingly have a controller which will decide how this wall should move. <coughs> so, you can see that uh, in this case uh, it is a you are directly computing the ratio which you are trying to control and uh, based on that ratio you are comparing its value with the desired value and taking a control action. So, therefore, it is known as a direct ratio control. It is straightforward to visualize and therefore, it is directly controlling ratio. So, that is why it is known as a ratio, direct ratio control. However, it suffers from a drawback that uh, this particular control strategy uh, is uh, sort of non-linear. Uh, what do I mean by that is uh, if you look at this particular controller, uh, for this controller, uh, the controlled variable which we generally designate as y is f a over f b and the manipulated variable u is f b. So, if I look at uh, how much is the gain between the controlled variable and manipulated variable, what you will realize uh, that uh, that particular gain <coughs> is is minus F A over F B square. So, you will see that uh, the gain of this particular controller is dependent on the instantaneous value of F A as well as F B. So, it is the gain of this controller or the, this the gain of this uh, system is going to be changing as uh, F A and F B change. So, this is sort of a non-linear uh, system between the control variable and manipulated input. And we have seen that the controllers which we have seen so far in terms of PID control, all those are linear controllers. So, in that case uh, as the process gain is going to change, the, uh, the optimum controller settings are also going to change depending on the value of the disturbance and this control strategy may not give you uh, best performance throughout uh, the disturbance uh, horizon or disturbance uh, window in terms of how much disturbance it can tolerate. Uh, depending on that value of FA ch changes in FA, the controller may perform as per expectation or may perform poorly. So, that is one of the major drawback of direct uh, ratio control. So, let us now see how this can be uh, avoided uh, or how this uh, error or this limitation can be rectified. So, that is done by using what is known as a indirect ratio control. <coughs> so, let us see, uh, let us take the same example we have F A as one of the streams and you are mixing it with another stream F B and in this case uh, in order to get the product or blend. So, in this case what you do is uh, you measure your value of F A. So, you have flow measurement. So, it will give you the value of F A and it will take in whatever is your F A over F B set. So, it takes in whatever is the set value of the ratio, it measures what is the current value of F A and by using these two it will compute whatever is the F B needed in order to maintain this ratio. So, you do not directly control the ratio or compute the ratio, you, you measure one of the disturbance variables use the set value of the ratio to compute what is the ideal value of F B for that corresponding uh, value of F A and then use this as a set point to control this particular flow. 
so now you will have this another flow measurement and depending on this error you will have a controller which will set the flow rate so you are indirectly controlling the ratio because as long as this fb is maintained at fb set my ratio of fa over fb will be set uh, equal to fa over fb set the advantage of this strategy is that now if you look at the control variable so i am going to control flow rate fb so the control variable y is fb and your manipulated variable u is also fb so if you look at your gain of this particular control uh, this system this is going to be 1 so it is going to be independent of disturbance so you can see that uh, by simply rearranging the way we are computing or using the ratio desired ratio we are now able to make sure that uh, the corresponding controller is linear the system is linear so that any pid controller will give you good result so that is why indirect ratio control is uh, preferred over direct ratio control <coughs> so that was ratio control let us now move uh, to the next uh, or the final uh, traditional advance control strategy uh, which is known as <coughs> inferential control so again as the name suggests what we are uh, going to do here is that uh, we are going to infer the controlled variable through some secondary measurement so let me first give you uh, the motivation for why we go about inferential control what do we mean by inferencing and what is the secondary measurement so let us again uh, go back to our very commonly used separation processes uh, it's a distillation and you know that in distillation we are interested in controlling the top purity <coughs> which would typically be done so let us say this is your top of the distillation column i am not showing whatever hap is happening in the bottom of the column so what we are interested in is maintaining uh, this final product purity and accordingly uh, we want to control the reflux rate now what happens is in a distillation column or in general when you want to measure purity these are not very straight forward measurement they are highly dependent on what uh, is the species which you are trying to measure sometimes uh, it may be easy to measure it online lot of times you have to take out the sample to process it in a lab and after the chemist processes the sample you would have a measurement of that particular man uh, control variable now you can see that uh, this process may take anywhere from a uh, few seconds to even sometimes a minutes and a few minutes or even a fraction of an hour so if you are seeing that your controller is not able to see what's happening during that time it cannot take any action all the feedback control strategy requires measurement of the control variable so here if uh, the chemist does not give you whatever is the current purity then you cannot take any control action till that time and uh, it's a uh, very easy to show that in case of such measurement delays uh, you have to go with a really slow controller uh, in order to make sure the system is stable so the purity a uh, lot of times may take a few hours uh, to get uh, to the desired value simply because you do not have uh, the composition measurements at a very fast frequency now this uh, poses a very big challenge in terms of operation or even design of a control system so what uh, we can be done is uh, rather than measuring uh, this composition what we can uh, we can use uh, can make use of some of our fundamentals of thermodynamics which says that uh, the we can take uh, this top of the column and if uh, this condenser is a complete condenser 
whatever was the composition in the vapor phase here the same uh, will be the composition at the distillate. Now you take uh, this composition uh, that composition is a function of temperature. So, if I take uh, a binary mixture if I have a I, if I need a particular composition at the top of the column that will give me a particular temperature uh, which should be at the top of the column again uh, given the fact that it is at a particular pressure. So, lot of time so most of the times you would operate your column at constant pressure. So, as long as the pressure in the column is set a particular temperature having a particular temperature will ensure that a particular purity is reached inside this column. And we have seen that these temperature measurements are very fast. So, nowadays the temperature measurement can be done uh, in a millisecond range or less than a sub second range. So, instead of measuring a composition which takes minutes or hours, we can infer the purity inside the column by measuring the temperature. So, this is known as an inner and then you can use this temperature measurement to control the purity indirectly in a sense that you will try to control this temperature by changing the manipulated variable which is the reflux ratio. So, rather than using purity measurements you would actually measure the temperature inside the column and then compare it what with whatever is the desired temperature uh, in order to ensure that uh, purity and then uh, that would be used as a con actual control variable in order to move the manipulated variable. So, this is known as an inferential control. So, here what we did was we inferred the purity inside the column by using a secondary measurement of temperature inside the column. Now, this is just an overview about uh, inferential control. It is not necessary that uh, you have to use only the top uh, tier temperature. In fact, uh, for a very high purity systems, you would not want to use uh, the top tray temperature uh, as a secondary measurement. And uh, there is a uh, there is lot of work done in terms of uh, finding out uh, which particular tray uh, is most sensitive to the composition changes and that particular tray temperature is used uh, as an inferential variable. So, in terms of uh, the quality qualities of uh, variables which uh, can be used as a secondary measurement uh, you can see that so if i say qualities of secondary measurement first and foremost it should have a strong effect on the primary control variable Very straightforward because if uh, whatever variable you are using to infer your main control variable, if it does not strongly affect that variable, then the control strategy would not work. The second uh, quality is that it should have fast measurement. So it should be, it should allow rapid measurement. Again, it ties up with the motivation of uh, inferential control. The whole idea was that primary control variable is not easy to measure or is very slow in terms of measurement. So, you want something uh, which can be measured fast. And then lastly which is a very tricky uh, issue is that preferably and I am saying preferably because it is not uh, always possible to do it should offer 1 to 1 mapping or relationship with the controlled variable. What I mean by this is uh, if I want to maintain my if we again go back to this example if I want my xd to be maintained at xd set and if I want to back calculate whatever what should be my t. then it should give me a single value of T set. So, it should be one to one mapping between the primary and secondary controlled variable. So, that you can always solve this system in order to get the um, secondary measurement. What if this T set at the same T set you can have two 
XD set, then the system may not uh, give you the desired performance that by maintaining T set, you cannot ensure whether you are going to get XD set 1 or XD set 2. So that is why I said uh, typically you would want a one to one relationship between the secondary and primary controlled variables. So uh, that brings us to the conclusion of uh, this section about traditional advanced controllers wherein we saw that uh, we moved from a single input single output uh, type of control strategy uh, in a feedback control sense and uh, we try to see how uh, it can be modified in terms of structure uh, to incorporate some of the situations which are uh, frequently encountered in chemical engineering like uh, we saw in order to uh, de reject a faster disturbance uh, we used a cascade type of a strategy uh, when we had multiple measurements possible in order to increase the range of controllability we used a split range type of a control strategy uh, when we had multiple uh, controlled variables but uh, fewer manipulated variables uh, we can use uh, an override strategy where one loop uh, is overridden by the other depending on the severity of that particular loop um, or if we want to maintain a certain ratio we can use direct or uh, indirect ratio control uh, to make sure that uh, we ensure that ratio or uh, the lastly we can use inferential control where we do not measure the primary control variable but we use a certain uh, secondary measurement uh, which has a relationship with the primary control variable. And then uh, so this is how uh, some of the advancements were done over a regular PID control in order to uh, increase the applicability of PID control in processes. Uh, we call them as advanced controller or they used to be called as advanced controller till the arrival of real advanced controllers which we will be seeing which we will see after the break. So thank you. <laughs>